Agents Podcast. Uh, today we've got a, an amazing guest with us. His name is David Green, and we're going to be talking about his new book coming out in February, I think, of next year. It's called Sold, Every Real Estate Agent's Guide to Building a Profitable Business. Think of a step-by-step -step guide for a brand new agent that takes them from A to Z. Nothing out there. That's what we're going to be diving into. And David is also a real estate agent, a very successful one. And I'll let David do his own intro, but you may have already heard him. He also runs a podcast for Bigger Pockets. So David, welcome to our show. Thanks for being with us. Thank we you very much, guys. Out, I'm excited. I, I spend a lot of my time talking about how to invest in real estate, but there's actually quite a bit of information to share about how to make a living selling real estate or use that income that you make selling real estate to invest into real estate. So I like talking about it all. I love it, man. All right. So tell us a little bit about you because you currently have a team, you're a real estate agent. Tell us about that. Yeah. So I actually backed my way into real estate, had no intention of doing this at all. I was a police officer. I bought a rental property that one of my buddies had under contract and he was moving away to go to Bible college and he was going to lose his earnest money deposit. And I just said, Hey, I'll buy your house someday. I'm going to have a family. I'll need a place to live. I'll just rent it out in the meantime. That was how I got started investing in real estate. I kind of got the bug, started working crazy overtime. I would work a hundred hours a week for times to save up Whoa. money to go buy rentals. And I really learned real estate through owning it myself. That was where I sort of put together my understanding of how this whole asset class works. At a certain point, I realized that law enforcement was trending in a direction I didn't want to go. And I could see that the writing was on the wall. I wasn't going to make it to 50 years old before I could retire. So I left that and I got my license and I started selling houses. And then I learned the business of real estate sales. Uh, I joined with Keller Williams. So a lot of my knowledge came from kind of like the teachings of Gary Keller, how to build a team, how to, how to treat your business business like a business instead of just a job. So I started hiring assistants and failing miserably at learning how to hire people and leverage things off. And after a couple of years of that, I finally started to turn the corner and improve in that area. So now I run a uh, real estate team. Most of the business still comes through me. We're on pace. We've already closed 75 million for 2020 and we're on pace to probably be around 85, 90 when the year ends. It's me and uh, three other agents and then about four admin. And we operate out of the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, East Bay. Oh, nice, man. You're not too far from us, right? Saul's in San Diego. I'm closer to Los Angeles, Ventura County. So I had no idea you were out in, in uh, our neck of the woods. I love yep, that. Absolutely. Yeah, we have nice, a lot of friends man. up there. All right. So besides you having an amazing previous book, for those of you checking David out online, Check out his other book, Buy, Rehab, Rent, Refin uh, Refinance, Repeat. That one's got 1,600 plus reviews that are five stars, which is insane, dude. That's, that's impressive, by the way. Good job on that. Thank you. And now he's got his new book coming out. So I'll put up the link on Amazon. But tell us about this book, Sold. Where, where did the idea come from first? And then take us through the book. So I, as a person running a real estate team, I'm constantly training new agents. And then as a person who is hosting the Bigger Pockets podcast, I'm getting people coming to me all the time saying, can you teach me this? What do I do? How do I do this? I'm struggling. How do I get started? And I don't think it's a surprise or a secret that there is a huge gap in knowledge or mentorship in our industry. I mean, that's why you guys exist. There's a huge hunger for people to say, somebody tell me what to do. I need help. And it's very difficult to make this work because the brokers, they don't want to invest all their time into someone who may not put anything that they're being taught into action. And the agents need someone to teach them before they get confidence that they can go put it into action. And that's really why, you know, maybe 17% of agents actually make it to where they become successful because there's so many factors working against them. So what I found myself doing was condensing all of the things I was teaching my new agents and sharing it with other people that came to me until eventually I said, I just need to put this in a book so everyone can can have it because there's no way I can tell everybody in the world what they should do. But there's such a huge, huge need for when you get your license. Now you're an agent. What do I do? Hey, David, you, you touched upon a really uh, great area, and that is lead generation. Yep. And everybody's interested in lead generation. And the way you do it is you 
exchange expertise for the lead, for the contact. You do podcasts. This creates a presence. This creates the message. And you seems like you've got more business than you can handle yourself. And that's why you have a team of people. You're the rainmaker and you've got a team to pass that to. And you, I used to use, uh, I did, used to do live seminars with an, a company called Learning Annex. And they would put on seminars and I would go and deliver. And what that created was leads. And those are usually good leads. They're warmer leads. They already trust you because they know you, you're good at what you're doing. So I just that one point, right? Utilizing the podcast to generate business for yourself and for the people that work with you. It's a great that is That is exactly right. Rather than trying to compete with some company that goes and finds online leads, which oftentimes turns into a random name and phone number of a person that logged into a site that they never even wanted to talk to an agent in the first place. Um, going to my own sphere of people that know me, like me, and trust me, servicing them by teaching them what they're interested. Do you want to learn how to flip houses? Do you want to learn how to invest in real estate? Let's talk about the difference in owning a house versus renting a house over a 20-year period of time, or just overall wealth building strategies. To yeah. that sphere of people, you become very valuable. You become the person that they think of in their own mind when they think of real estate, which is really what every rainmaker is good at. If you think about any any business that's good in any way, when you think computers, you think Apple. That's that's why they're doing well. So this is all about serving your audience. And I have a bigger audience than most because I have this podcast, but everyone can be that person to somebody, to some group of people so that they associate your name with whatever the thing is that you want to help people with and then systematically staying in touch with them. So they come to you. And exactly like you said, at that point, you've got leads, which is what allows you to build a team because most agents know that they should be lead generating, but they don't know what to say. They don't have the confidence to do it. Usually you need to close deals to learn what to do, but you can't close deals until you know what to say. You don't know what to say till you've done it. You get in this negative spiral. And so, you know, what I'm teaching people is this is how you can get started. This is how you can get experience and confidence and then start lead generating so that everybody wins. Well, another great point is you don't need to have a big audience to start. What you have to be willing to do is talk to anybody that'll talk to you. And it might be one person, it might be two people, it might be three people, but you go about set out to get in front of people so that you can help them learn about real estate. Now, everybody wants to learn about real estate. It's the center of everybody's life. And, uh, and you found that and you tap into it and you develop, like I said, the trust and confidence and that builds a stream of, of prospects for your business. That's exactly right. It was really kind of boring when people say like, where'd all your leads come from? Well, I met this person at an open house and I just talked to him and <laughs> this, I knew this guy in college and we kind of just stayed in touch over the years, or this was an old coworker that I found on Facebook and just started talking. And because they associate me with real estate, they come to me for questions on how the whole thing works when it's time to sell their house or they want to buy a house. It's a quick, easy phone call for them to make. All right, dude. I, I love that. Now, before we get into the book on where it starts and how you're helping like different chapters and so forth. I want to know what got, what got you to write? Like what, why, why writing? Cause we're investing in real estate. Why become an author? Tell me, tell me where that came from and why the first book, why, why did you publish that first book specifically? Okay. It's not as cool of a story as you're going to think. I, <laughs> I, it's so simple. It, it's almost embarrassing how simple when I, I used to listen to the bigger pockets podcast and I loved it. And I was, this is when I was buying rentals and I mostly just went there looking for affirmation. Am I doing the right thing? Is this crazy? Everyone in my life is telling me I shouldn't do it, but it seems like I should. And so I started listening to that podcast and, and really learning it myself. And then through a series of cool events, I met Hal Elrod, who wrote The Miracle Morning, and he introduced me to the people at Bigger Pockets, and I got on their podcast, and they loved my story. They loved that I was just a blue-collar police officer that saved up money and bought real estate. They put me on the show, and it went really well. At the end of it, I asked Brandon Turner, who's now my co-host, hey, I love your site. What can I do to help? I, can I start writing blog articles for you guys? He said, sure. Here's the blog person. You should talk to them. When I got introduced to them, I said, what can I do to write the best articles of anyone on the site? What's the stuff that gets the most clicks? What's the stuff your audience wants to see? Are they long? Are they short? I really dove deep to figure out what does it take to be good at writing blog articles? Then I had to go learn how to write, so to speak, right? I had to run this by other people before I submitted it to them. I just really wanted to be good. 
I started getting chosen as the editor's choice every week because my articles were really, I was just putting more effort in than the other people that were writing blogs. And then they came to me and said, hey, you write really good. Everyone likes you. We think that we want to expand our publishing company. How do you feel about writing a book? I said, okay. They said, pick a topic. And I said, well, no one else is really writing about how to invest long distance. That's, that's what I'll write about. So I wrote my first book. I talked to a couple of people that had written books before to learn how to write an outline and sort of how that process would go. That book won an award. And then I got approached about writing another book. And I said, how about the Burr method? That's the one that you mentioned, Tristan, that's, that's getting really, that's selling really well. And it's as simple as take the opportunity you're given, do the very, very best that you possibly can with it and wait and see what doors that opens for you. So that's so well said. Tristan, you know, why would you write a book? And, and uh, it gives you presence, right? And, and it gives you that celebrity authority, David. So every time you write a book, every time somebody sees that, it just adds to your celebrity authority, which then adds to the trust people will put in you. And, and the bottom line is it's all about trust. That's yes. and one way to build trust is demonstrate expertise. And you're doing that constantly with your clients. And it's similar to the podcast. When you listen to me talk every week or you read a book that I wrote, you get to know me in a sense. It makes it much easier to build trust, which is exactly what you're getting at here, Saul. And we all know everyone says the same thing. People need to know you, like you, and trust you. And if you can start with trust, becoming likable is a skill that you can build. And then it just becomes known, which is what you mentioned earlier. Just talk to anybody that'll listen to you. The more people who know who you are, the bigger your business is going to grow. Yeah, I love that. All right. So let's get into this book, Sold. It's coming out in February. I just checked it out on Amazon. I just placed an order. So thank you for that. Let's talk about where you start here, because I think most agents are, when I started as an agent, I, I honestly had no clue what to do. I thought, well, uh, thank God I had a, a mentor to help me sell because they said, okay, come door knocking with me. And I learned it that way. But where do you start in that book? Well, you probably the reason you became successful, Tris, and I'm sure there's many reasons, but a big piece was you found that mentor. And the people that find the mentor that takes them under their wing are so much more likely to be successful. So this book was written partially with the intention of being that mentor and partially with the intention of helping you find that mentor. I give practical examples that worked in my own career, like find the agent in your office that's selling a lot of houses and find what they hate. Most of them don't like putting out open house signs on the weekends. So I found the top producer in my office and I said, hey, I'll show up. I'll put out all your open house signs and I'll pick them up. All that I want to know is, can I run questions by you when I have them? Can I sit in your open house and listen to the way you talk to people? Believe it or not, I was massively introverted. I was terrified of talking to anybody that I didn't know. I couldn't stand it unless, you know, I had handcuffs or something and I could give you an order <laughs> just to have to be vulnerable and talk to somebody was the worst thing ever. And so by offering to help the other agents with things that they didn't like, they naturally took an interest in helping me. So I would go like, oh, you don't want to show homes this weekend? I'll go take out your client. And I would wear a suit and I would do everything I could to make that agent look so good. And when I had a question about how to comp a house or why did this lead not follow up with me, they now wanted to help me because I had been helping them. And that's a lost art in this industry. This like apprenticeship concept that you've got to earn your way into someone helping you. You can't show up on day one, have brought zero value to anyone and say someone else has to teach me what to do that is a w2 mindset that is how it works when you're getting paid to work the cash register at a mcdonald's i'm only getting paid 12 dollars an hour so i expect you to walk me through and micromanage every little thing just touch the screen right there when you become an entrepreneur when you step into this world of sales nobody is you're not getting anything from anybody that's owed to you. You have to go make it for yourself and you've got to figure out a way to incentivize others to want to help you. So in addition to like the little things that I feel like don't get told to agents, one of the big ones I'm sure you guys would agree is it's not just what to say. There is a right way to share information and a wrong way to share information. Okay. When I was new and we'd get an offer, I'd call my seller. And I'd say, okay, bad news. We got an offer and it's way below asking price. This is how I would start off the conversation until my mentor heard me and said, what are you doing? Why would you, why would you ever say that? Say it like this. And it made all the difference in the world. So 
this book is full of those types of examples. This is the right way to go about doing it, as well as, like I mentioned, here's how you ingrain yourself with someone who's already successful so that they can teach you because that mentor is so important. Dave, does the book have like, is it step by step? Do you have checklists in it that where people can just follow along? There's a lot of step by step stuff like getting your uh, all your database into a CRM. This is how you now introduce yourself and say, hey, I'm in real estate without making it sound too pushy or salesman-y. This is the way you create a system to systematically follow up with people and have genuine conversations. And then here's how you transition them into real estate without just jumping out and saying, hey, I'm in real estate now. Call me when you want to sell a house. You want to get them asking you, so what's new in your life? What are you excited about? And being able to share the information naturally. And then there's a lot of stuff just about like what I call like the fundamentals of the business. Here's how you fill out an offer form. Here are the words you say to the listing agent when you're writing an offer representing buyers that make you look more serious or your clients look better. Uh, here's some common objections that everyone's going to have. Your own clients are going to object here. The other uh, agents on the other side are going to object here. And this is the way that when that comes in that you handle that with the intention of helping build that confidence that's lacking so that because the reality is you guys know if you don't lead generate, you don't get business. That's how you survive in this world. I want to equip the readers to feel confident with lead generations because there's no substitute for that. So can I ask you a question about your, about your audience? Like yeah. so who did you write this book for? Is it for the, the person who's brand new or they've been around for a year and they don't have any productivity or they've been around two years or they're five years or they're a super producer who would you say, or does, does everybody get something out of this? That is a great question. It's This book is the first of a three-part series. So this book particularly is for the new or the inexperienced agent, the person who's not producing like they want. And, and you know that's you if you just have this feeling like I'm not very confident in what I do every day. I say I know I'm an agent, but I always feel weird when I give out my card or I haven't completely embraced the identity of I'm an, a salesperson or I'm an agent. The second book in this series, which hasn't come out yet, will be geared towards, you know how to do your job. This is what top producers do. This is how they think. This is what they do every day. This is how they handle problems. This is how you elevate to become the top in your marketplace. And the third book will be, this is how you build a team around you to scale huge and not work yourself to death. This is how you can sell 100 houses a year and work five hours a week. Uh, but that's a great question. This, this first book here is specifically for, I need to get this thing off the ground and I'm just struggling. Well, and a lot of people have been around for a couple of years and still need to get it off the ground. Right? That's exactly yeah. right. I was going to say that. That's a really good point. And so I, I like what you've done, David, because the, the go-to book right now for, for real estate, for the most part, is the real estate agent millionaire. Or the yeah, the MREA. Right. The MREA, yeah. The millionaire real estate agent. That's the one. And as great as it is, it dives deep into a lot of things that, that most agents at a higher level are doing, Right. And so it kind of just pushes you right into everything without giving you that, the, the basics or the basis, uh, the basis of starting a business. And I love that you have that in there. So uh, what got you to thinking about, hey, this is where we need to start with real estate agents. Let's start at step one. Was it because you were getting that question a lot or what happened? I was constantly being asked by people in my own market center, can you teach this class? Can you help these new agents? Mm, I would it. see people coming to me with these high level concepts like they learned in that book, but having zero idea how to apply it. So I think The Millionaire Real Estate Agent is an amazing book, but I look at it like it's a map. Here's where the stream is. Here's where the mountain is. Here's where the rivers are. This is a general direction of where you want to go and here's how you travel. My book is more like, this is how you tie your shoes. This is how much water to drink. These are the, the plants you don't want to touch. Very, very practical things that every new person who's starting on this journey doesn't want to start walking until they feel confident with those things. How to set up your business. Yes. How to set up your business, what to do in your first 30 days. That's exactly right. Yeah. Do you give any tips on prospecting and where to go for prospecting? How does that look? Yeah, there's an entire chapter on uh, lead generation and then another on lead follow-up. So I actually provide what I think is a super simple way to get started, where you take an app that will take every single contact out of your cell phone, put it into a CSV file, easily upload that into whatever CRM you want to use, eliminate the people that you don't want in there, 
And then you, it, it's just that CRM should remind you, call this person today and ask them whatever you want it to be. It should start very simple. Hey, we haven't caught up in the last six years. I see on Facebook, you've got two kids. Tell me about how it goes. You shouldn't touch real estate at all until that person starts asking questions about you and your life. What are you excited about? What have you been up to? Then it's a very easy way to start to mention, oh, I got my real estate license. I'm showing houses this weekend. I'm so excited about it. They will naturally want to ask you how that's going. Okay. That's a super easy way that people can put a database together and get started. And really agents should be doing that before they're even agents. When they're studying to get their license, that's when they should be planting these seeds. Because most of the time, the, the business I'm working now is from work I did six to nine months ago, on average, I would say. Conversations I had yeah. with somebody way before that they remembered, and now they're like, you know what? I'm nervous about this presidential election and what could take place. I'm worried about where the economy is going. I'm worried about COVID. I want to get out of my condo and I want to get in a house. David sounded really smart when I talked to him. He seemed like he knew what was going on. That becomes a deal to me. So Part of it is also the mindset aspect that this is not a W-2 job. So many people get in the bad habit of thinking that being in the office is equivalent to getting paid because at every job we had before we were an agent, that's how it worked. I show up, I clock in, my physical presence in this place equals money being made. If I have to do anything when I'm here, my goal is to do as little as possible. So I see so many agents sitting in my office that are answering emails or talking to each other or designing marketing flyers, really anything they can to avoid having to talk to human beings and thinking in their subconscious that they're working. I was at work all day. They did nothing that will actually lead to any work. So I like to give people kind of like a, a framework or a mindset that helps agents understand there's only certain things that you did that day that e equaled work. The rest of it was just something you spent your time doing. And I have a concept called the sales funnel that really covers these are the five levels of a transaction. This is how you start at the top level and work your way down to the bottom, which is what actually will equal money. Wow, I love that. A couple of good, good points you make is the, the marketing that you did yesterday creates the business of today. Yeah. The marketing you do today creates the business of tomorrow. And that's the, you have to constantly remind yourself of that. And that's exactly what you just said. And then the, another great uh, concept is the value of the database. Now we all say this and we all pay lip service to the value of the database, but really in your database, you're really building profiles. That's what that's about. And you begin with, you already have a database. You just, it's just here, right? If yep. you're brand new in real estate, you've already got it. You just got a first, first step, bring it all together. You give, get an app. It's easy to do. Get CSV file, load that thing, and then start building profiles so that you can talk to people because that helps you build rapport. That builds trust and confidence. It's, it's a conversation, right? Selling real estate is an ongoing conversation with people. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying door knocking is a bad thing to do. It obviously, if it helps you meet people and put them in your database, it's helpful. But I wouldn't say that a person you meet knocking on a random stranger's door is more valuable to than a person that's already in your phone that you've known for nine years. And there's something that we just skip about teaching people how to start with your own little fertile piece of soil and build from there. And once you've got that down, then you can go door knocking and doing these things to bring in those people into that world. And there's a, there's a question here for you, but, but first that app that you're talking about, David, is that MC backup? Yep, that's Jane? exactly the one I use. I love that one. All right, cool. That was my question. All right, there's a question here from the audience by Janet or Jeanette. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, but uh, what's the name of his second book that he talks about where she's been in the business for 14 years and a top producer for the last five years. She's more interested in that book. Is that that second book that you're talking about, David? When does that come out? Yes, and we it doesn't have a publishing date determined yet. So this one's been pushed back a couple months. The book's written, it's waiting to go to editing. And so I, I don't have a title for it yet and I don't have a, a published date for the second book. But my guess is it would probably be four to six months after this first one comes out that that one will be released. All right, but you've also got that other book that you wrote previously, right? Which was Buy, Rehab, Rent, Refinance, and Repeat. Is that the that, one? Yes, and that one was written for real estate investors that are looking to buy properties, fix them up, and then refinance to get their capital out keep it as a short-term rental and reinvest that money. Got it. I, I put that link in there for Janet, just in case, Janet, Thank you were looking for that one too. Uh, and then I'll repost the other link for, for his book that comes out in February. So now 
let's continue along the process of this book sold, right? So we've talked a little bit about where we start, about where that looks, uh, what that looks like. Then uh, Saul was bringing up the fact that you also have processes in there, right? In, in a couple of the chapters, even follow-up. What do you recommend with follow-up? Like, what does that look like for you? So part of the mistake I see so many agents make is they focus on lead generation, which I would describe as going out in the world and telling everyone you can, hey, I'm an agent, reminding them in some way that you exist and looking for people. It's every once in a while you catch that low hanging fruit where they just happen to be ready to sell their house that minute and you get a listing out of it or you find a buyer, which is awesome. But the majority of trees do not come down from one chop of the ax. And it's, it's so frustrating just for me to watch people that are out there swinging an ax at one tree in the forest and it doesn't fall and they go swing the next one when you're not going to knock down that tree till you hit the same one over and over and over. Lead follow-up is the, the key that I believe top producers understand and that they do well that leads to a really big business. It is planting a seed and then the lead follow-up is the act of watering that seed and weeding that seed so other agents don't come in and take that person from you, strengthening the level of the soil that's there so that that seed stays in your database, keeping in touch with these people who may have wanted to buy a house at one time. I give this really, I, I think it's an awesome example. And maybe I'll run it by you guys. Um, let's say that you walk into a Nordstrom's and stop me if you guys have already said this before. And you are looking for a coat, okay? And the salesperson comes up to you and they say, hello there, Tristan. Um, is there anything I can help you with? What's your standard response you give every time? Just looking. There you go. No, thanks. Just looking. Nobody really says, yeah, I want a coat. This is the price I want to pay because you probably don't know. It's somewhere in your subconscious. You just know the feeling you get when you see a coat you like and you think the price is good. You can't articulate that out loud. So you say, no, thanks. Just looking. Then you start looking and you see the clearance rack, 70% off. You love the coat. It fits perfect. You just want to go try it on in the dressing room and see how it looks. You look up and you see a salesperson. Do you care that that salesperson you make eye contact with is the same one that you talked to when you first walked in that asked to help you? Would you guys go looking for that first salesperson and say, no, 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 I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to them. No, definitely not. Dude. You no. go to the person that's closest, right? There you go. <laughs> Who's got the key that can open this dang door? I just want to try on this coat. That yeah. is how the majority of people look at a real estate agent. If you happen to be the one that was there when they found the house they wanted and they wanted to see it, boom, they're going to give it to you. Nobody asked the salesperson at Nordstrom, what's your sales record? How many of these coats have you sold? How much do you know about it? Can you tell me about a warranty? They're not thinking that way. Most people look at agents in a very similar manner. If you want to be a good sale coat salesperson, you got to stay within eye shot of that client. So when they pull up this coat and say, who can let me in the dressing room? You're the first person they see. And that's what lead follow-up really is in our business. It is staying in touch so that when they decide, I do want to sell my house or now I'm serious, I want to go buy another one or whatever the case is, boom, they're looking at you right there. If you just focus on lead generation, you run around Nordstrom asking every single person, can I help you? Can I help you? Can I help you? Can I help you? You're way less likely to be successful than the one who picks out. No, that person is the good client. I'm going to stay in touch. I'm going to keep anyone else from talking to them. They're going to come looking for me when it's time to open that dressing room. Yeah, it's convenience, right? There's a value. In, but you're right. You have to stay top of mind in real estate. Was it average term of home ownership like five to eight years? And so when you talk to people, they're not going to need you today. So how do you stay top of mind? And you know what real estate people try to do most of the time is to just put their name in front of people. And they just use and that's and they don't go beyond that, right? So we see realtors' names on the bus benches and all these different places. But what's the next step and the next step? And how do you, you know, real estate sales is a relationship business. So how do you make that relationship stronger and stronger and stronger? That is the million dollar question. And if you do it well, you'll become the million dollar agent. One of the techniques, because we all have to play to our own strengths. Okay. We're not, this is what makes real estate awesome is that what works for David is very different than what works for Saul or what works for Karen. I do it by teaching people what I know. Do you want to learn how to um, increase your ROI investing in real estate? I will put on a meetup. You will come for free. A hundred people show up. I feed them. I teach them. We build a connection during that time. I mentioned several times, hey, when you guys are ready to buy a house, contact me. and I'll help you guys do what we're talking about here. There's other agents that can accomplish the same thing by hosting Tupperware parties. 
they bring 25 people from their database to their house and they do a Tupperware party or they have one of those like candle, come here and buy the candles you want. You can do this by being the person that always hosts every time there's a boxing match, a UFC fight, a, a football game. It's really not complicated stuff, but you have to be purposeful about it. You have to figure out what do I feel comfortable talking about? Where do, can I bring value to people? And purposefully creating an environment that they're going to come to you to get that. And while they're there, they're going to see your name. They're going to hear you talk about real estate. It's very natural when you do it right. Well, it's, it's knowledge is power. It's information is the currency of the 21st century, mm -hmm. Alvin Toffler, and your ability to demonstrate your expertise to people. So it all makes sense. Years ago, my real estate company, we you know you have a byline underneath the name of the company. Our byline underneath the name of our company was a real estate services and education company. That's what we told people we were, right? This is our real estate company. We're a real estate services and education company because we wanted to give people because for a number of reasons, right? And people are better off for it. And that's how you generate people that I still get phone calls from people, phone calls from people, not to buy and sell real estate anymore, but just to ask financial questions. Mm -hmm. And I don't do that for people anymore, but I still, right. But I still get the calls because we built these relationships over these many, many years. Yeah. And that sort of illustrates the point you made earlier about the, the business you get today is from the work you did in the past. You're still seeing that because they look to you as the person to educate them that they feel comfortable talking to. Were you still in the business? Those would be leads for you. Right. You know, I've always looked at lead generation and I use this example in the second book that's not out yet. Like <clears throat> you're getting started. You've got this huge, heavy boulder that you're just trying to push up this hill. And every single step is painstakingly, agonizingly slow. It's so much work as you get your name out there and you talk to people and you build your knowledge and you build your confidence and you learn how to have conversations smoothly. And you're just shoving, shoving, shoving all the time. And at a certain point in your career, you get so good at doing that, that instead of feeling like you're going uphill, you kind of crest and you're just going straight. You're just, this ball moves a lot easier. This boulder moves on its own. I'm not pushing against gravity. Lead generation is much easier, much more natural. You figure out what works for you. Maybe you, you become the person in your, your PTA group that you just crush it there, or you run the uh, fantasy football league. And so they all know you as a realtor in that space. And then after enough time, you become like Saul, where you're actually on the other side of that mountain and that boulder's rolling down and you can't even keep up with it. You're running as fast as you can go and that that boulder's getting away from you and you have more leads coming in than you know what to deal with and that's when you really need to build a team of people around you to help service them so for those that are first getting started it's supposed to suck when you're pushing a boulder uphill it's never going to be fun you got to remember that you're doing it to get to the top if you're not committed to getting all the way to the top it's probably not a good business to get into but it is a business where you like you say when you started and many of the people that I know in real estate are like this. It's a, it becomes a passion. Mm -hmm. It be, I used to say it's, you catch the real estate disease. And, and so it's easy to, to spend a hundred hours. You mentioned a hundred hours a week because you love it. Right. And because it's part of what you do and you like interacting with people and you like helping them. And there's all these positive, this positive reinforcement, even if the money's not coming in sometimes. Right. And so you just keep driving. Yeah. And you've gained all this knowledge that you now want to share with the new hungry agents that are coming in. I've, that's why I really feel the natural progression is to start off pushing that boulder and then to either become a broker or a team leader or some form of leader where you're bringing in these new people underneath you. And that's really what I kind of want this book to serve as is I've got all this knowledge that I had to learn the hard way. I had to make a lot of mistakes to get to the point that I could have conversations that left the client feeling very confident, comfortable, knowing what it is they wanted. I think you guys can agree that's a big part of our job as an agent is helping our clients figure out what it is they even want to do because because they don't know. Um, so if you're, I don't know that it really works to just say, I'm going to be a solo agent for the next 40 years. That's, that's really tough. You should be able to get to the point where you're influencing other people and making their lives easier too. I love that, man. That's a really good point. So let's continue then on this trajectory of going along the book. Do you give any advice as to what people, what real estate agents should get tech-wise, like CRMs or, or any type of lead generation technology, anything like that or no? 
That's really good. In the lead follow-up chapter, I talk about the three simple sources that we use to help manage our database and our leads. The first is a CRM, exactly like what you mentioned. The second are the way we set up spreadsheets. So when a new lead comes in, you immediately put it in a spreadsheet and then there's a column of every step you take from the minute the lead comes in to the point that they're ready to look at houses. And we do it like that on my team, A, so that we don't have anything slip through the cracks because lead bleed is very expensive once you get moving at a big level. And two, it gives confidence to the newer agents who don't know what am I supposed to do by saying, okay, the lead comes in, you have an introduction call. This is exactly what the point is. You're trying to create adhesion, build rapport with that client, make them like you. The next thing is you're going to set an appointment where you're going to meet them in person. At that appointment, you're going to give a presentation. Here's the presentation you're giving. Here's what you're doing. And then the third thing is what I call like the whiteboard system. And this is where on all the agents on my team, right above their desk, there's just a whiteboard hanging on the wall that has like hot buyers, you know, so-so, and then a nurture so that they don't forget if they even forget to look at their spreadsheet, who am I supposed to be talking to today? It keeps the client front of mind so they don't go four days without, oh shoot, I met that person at open house. I was supposed to talk to him, but I got busy. That makes sense, man. All right. So take us through through that next chapter as it's, as you're getting closer to the book ending, what does that look like? Where do you wrap up for, for this book? So the second to last chapter is about mindset. And this is where you get into understanding that not every lead is the same. So when I talk about the sales funnel, I basically classified what I wanted was a framework that agents could understand that they needed to think this way because they're not in a W-2 job. You actually have to turn your brain on and ask yourself with everything that crosses your desk, is this valuable for me to be pursuing? So at the top of this funnel is a person, people. That's anybody in the world. Right below that would be a lead. And I classify a lead as someone who wants to buy or sell a house and knows who you are. Okay. A person with a question about real estate is not a lead until you've determined, well, do they actually want to buy or sell a house? And can they do it? And that's a mistake a lot of new agents make is every single thing that crosses their desk, they go, okay, I'm supposed to go do that. That person doesn't own a home or if they did, they were going to use their mom as their agent, not you or whatever the case may be. So when someone says, hey, what are houses worth in my area? The question the agent should ask is, well, are you asking because you want to buy one or do you have one to sell? And then pursuing the conversation from that point. The, the tool that you would use to turn people into leads is lead generation. We've discussed that. Then the tool that you would use to turn leads into clients, which would be the next step, would be these in-person presentations, a listing presentation or a buyer's presentation. And oh. I give those to the agents on my team and they practice. This is what you do to show your value to see if that person's going to be a client. If they don't want to be your client, you're not going to spend your time talking to that person or pursuing that person when there's someone out there who might be. A client is defined as someone who signed a listing agreement or a buyer rep agreement. At that point, that person has earned the right for me to just pour all my knowledge into them to give them everything that I need. They are a client in this relationship. And the next step would be a contract. That's a, a, a residential purchase agreement that's been signed by a buyer and a seller. The tool that we use to get uh, clients into contract is psychology. This is your ability to talk to people, to ease their fears, to answer their questions, to help them feel comfortable moving forward. And then the last step would be a closing. That's a, a escrow that is closed. And the tool that we use to get you from a contract to a closing is knowledge. This is where your understanding of the mortgage industry or what happens in the title and escrow side or uh, maybe rehab work and the numbers that would go along with that really come into play. And one of the mistakes I found is that new agents think that they need to have all this knowledge, but that doesn't even come into play until you've got something in escrow. It's when, true. When you're in the beginning, you just need lead generation. Knowledge is also the easiest thing to leverage. It's very easy. You go to your broker, you go to another agent, you go to another person in the office, you say, what do you do when it needs a new roof? And they can explain to you, well, it's going to cost X amount of money. You want to credit for, for why here's how you should say it. So that sales funnel is what we practice on my team so that when something comes across your plate, you immediately say, where do I classify this? And then what is the tool that I use to move it to the next step? Because not everything that happens in a day is exactly, is worth your time as a, as a realtor for your business. So that's a big, big part of this book is introducing people to this way of thinking that I, I call the sales funnel. It's just classifying where is this person in this funnel? And then what would the next step be to move them down? Can I even do it? 
And then uh, the mindset chapter really talks about determining is the person motivated? Because it doesn't matter how much knowledge you have. If they don't really want to buy a house, you can put them in your car and show them 50 homes. You're not getting anywhere. What are questions you can ask to determine if they are motivated? Real estate mortician. Yeah. We call them real estate mortician, throw people in the backseat of your car and drive them around until they're dead. That's funny. That's funny. So and you're, you're not, talking about that funnel. Here's the words, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, or you. When you talk about the sales funnel, you start out. I used to call them suspects. Okay, that's everybody in the world. And yep. then the next step is people are prospect, but that doesn't mean that they're a lead. A lead is somebody who wants to buy real estate. I like to throw in within a certain period of time and in Good. a certain price range. That helps you then prioritize that lead, and then they sign a listing agreement or a buyer broker agreement. They become a client. And then you go to closing and then you follow up after that. And then you get better at finding people deeper in the funnel. There you go. We've never talked Saul, but we're speaking the same language here because our <laughs> funnels are pretty much the same thing. That's very affirming. Cause I know you've been in this business for a long time. You're exactly right. You're looking for people that are closer to the closing at the very bottom of it than what you would call a suspect that are at the top. Yeah. And even in my conversations with suspects or what I call people, the goal is always to get you to become a lead someday. That's what lead generation does is I'm spreading the word. I'm planting seeds so that when you want to buy or sell, you come to me. The goal of the lead is to get you in front of me, give you a presentation, secure you as a client of mine. The goal of our clients is to put them into contract. You really, really, really need as a new agent to get hyper-focused on what you're doing with every person in that funnel because they're not going to walk themselves down to the bottom. It's right. your job to guide them there. Nice, man. All right. We have a, a question here from Amanda Smith. How would you handle a seller who doesn't really want to sell, but is just interested in testing the market? My understanding in my career as a real estate salesperson is that nobody sells their house unless they want to buy another house. They have some other need for the money or they've recently passed away and their family's selling it. It's a big pain in the butt to sell a house. So this is why we don't typically have to ask, is a seller motivated? Because the work they had to go through to get their house ready to sell it is usually shows an inherent motivation. But in this case, they're showing maybe they're not. What I would do is I would go to the pain point the seller has and try to figure out why would you want to sell it in the first place? If you're testing the market, it's for a purpose. You're trying to figure out, can I get X amount of money? Is that because you want to buy a different house? Is that because you want to downsize? Is that because you want to pay off your credit card bills and you want some of the equity to do it? Or is it an ego thing? Do you just want to be the one who said, I sold? Like in my market, we've got million dollar homes. There's something about selling a house for a million dollars instead of 950,000 that gets every seller excited. Is that what really matters to them? Um, and then the advice I'd give to the agents, and this is a mistake new agents make all the time. You can't with your own vigor or excitement or skill, create motivation in your client. It's there or it's not. And you got to be honest with yourself. If they say they want to test the market and you say, well, what are we testing it for? And they don't have an answer. They're, they're probably not motivated. You've got to figure out why they would even want to know in the first place. Such a it's good no point. Easy, it's no easy task. If you actually put it on the market, then you'd have all kinds of tasks, chores you'd have to do and showings. And do they really want to go through that? That's it takes exactly a commitment right. to sell a home. And that's why I say the tool that you use to turn a client into a contract, which in this case would be taking a listing and actually getting it in contract is psychology. Cause you've got to figure out from that seller, why are you trying to do this in the first place? What are your fears? Like that's an actual skill an agent has to have. It doesn't just happen on its own with insanely motivated people you can get away with having very low skills if someone's like eh, my job just told me i gotta move to texas i gotta sell my house in the next two weeks you can fumble your way to the finish line with someone who's that motivated but that's not everybody and like you mentioned saul the question you should be asking yourself is is this the best use of my time do i want to spend all this money and take all this time putting a house on the market that's not going to sell when i could be spending it going to the leads i already have and determining who's going to be a good client or the clients i have and finding ways to put them in contract one of the pieces you left out here that we left out talking about is referrals that's another oh. piece in the lead side right you talk about referrals at all um, in this book, I don't talk about it a ton, but referrals are a natural byproduct of lead generation. When you talk about real estate all the time, you're going to get people that will say, hey, I think I'm going to go buy in Los Angeles. Do you know anybody down there? 
Um, part of what benefited me was I wrote a book. The very first one I wrote was called Long Distance Real Estate Investing. So everybody comes to me and says, hey, I think I want to buy in Tennessee. Do you think it's a good idea? And that becomes a referral opportunity to connect me with an agent in Tennessee and a now an agent in Tennessee that will send me those deals back. So never underestimate the importance of branding yourself as the real estate person to your sphere, because a lot of those people would have gone to you looking for help, but they didn't even know that you were an option. Yeah, the attitude, you know, we used to, the attitude we always like to, to push at our, at our agents was, have I done everything I can to earn your referral business? That was a mindset. And whether or not they asked it of everybody, because sometimes they feel embarrassed asking it, right? Have I done everything I can to earn your referral business? I want to be able to ask that. And I want people to be able to say yes, right? That's where, where I'm headed. Oh, I see where you're going with that. That is in the book 100%. In fact, yeah. lead generation is not just about getting someone to buy a house for themselves. One of my little sneaky tricks that I'll use is, uh, give me one second, I'll get the, the audio going again. I will say to people, hey, I understand that you don't have a house to buy or sell right now. No problem at all. Just consider me your realtor until that time comes. And anyone you know in your family, your coworkers, your friends, I'm happy to have a conversation with them just like this. I literally plant the seed in their mind that they should think of me when their coworker says, hey, we're, we just got a raise. I think we're going to buy another house. That, exactly. that is lead generation. You're not just looking for the people themselves. You're trying to get into their whole world. Leverage. Good one. Good one. All right. Uh, there's a question here from a new agent. And then obviously, if you have any questions here or on the Facebook chat, let us know. I'll ask David or Saul can ask David. But here's a great one for you. Hello, as a new agent, would it best would it be best to work alone for a while or join a team? Why? Why not? What's your take on this, David? Yeah, this is such a controversial question. It is, man. Uh, it is. And so the first thing I'll say before I get into it is that not all teams are the same. Okay. So there's people that have a horrible response to just the word team because it was a scam, right? Like we pay for a bunch of cheap online leads and we throw them at you and then we want half your commission to do nothing. And then yeah. there's other teams that are literally taking people under their wing, trying to train them everything they know. And then those people leave once they're good. And then that team member gets burned. So it goes both ways. Okay. When you're joining a team, what you should be asking is, what are they giving me and what am I giving them? That's the first question, because not all teams are the same. So don't assume that that's the case, just like not all agents are the same, not all clients are the same. And the next question would be, based on your personality, where do you work best? So the people that work best with it on my team are people who love helping people. They love showing homes. They love being a part of the experience of giving somebody their keys. They love looking houses up on the MLS. They love being the one that the buyer calls and says, oh my gosh, I'm just so scared. I don't really enjoy that side of the business. I, I'm not as emotionally uh, invested. I'm much more of a cerebral, well, this will save them a lot of money. So here's the idea. Let's go do this. When you take a person that is maybe not loving lead generation, they don't love the pressure of running the whole thing. They don't want to be forced to get their own leads all the time. And you pair them with a person like me that wants to generate as many leads as possible, help as many people as possible, but I don't get emotional gratification out of it. You've got the perfect match. So if you're someone who's listening to this and you think like David thinks, no, I want to go out there and I want to talk to my sphere and I want to get 500 people a year to buy a house. I just don't want to have to actually put the information in the MLS. You probably don't want to join a team. You probably want to start a team and you want to provide a service to the agents who, in my humble opinion, the majority of agents that get their license and sign up with a broker don't love the things that make you successful as an agent. They don't love lead generation. That's why we are constantly saying the same things all the time. You've got to lead generate. If people like doing it, then they, we wouldn't be telling them they have to do it. We'd be telling them, what do you do when you get the lead? So if you know what's holding you back is that you don't have a ton of confidence. You don't like to go talk to people all the time. When you hear Saul say, you got to talk to everyone and you think, you know what? I know I do, but I just know I'm not going to do it. Get yourself hooked up with the person who does like that. And then you go to give amazing service to those people so that they give referrals to the team after that and you make that team leader love you. You know, when I first got into real estate, I had no sales background. I had no real estate background except what I learned from my parents and buying and selling when they moved. And, and uh, 
I got a real estate license, got a broker's license, went to work as a salesperson in an office, but I really was not very confident. And I met another person who was just like me, brand new, didn't, he'd never done any sales. And we, both of us were not confident in what we were, thought we might be able to do. And so we became partners. Now, as it turned out, we stayed partners for 35 years and invested in properties and had real estate companies, but it started because we were brand new and we liked each other and we trusted each other and we formed a partnership, which then grew into a team, which then grew into a company, but it started because we were not confident in our own abilities. And it's always, if you're not confident, you like to have some, somebody with you that's not confident, right? And we went out <laughs> and actually felt like we were ready to conquer the world, but, but it's helpful when there are other people around, right? Yeah, and I think part of it is a mindset shift where you go from thinking real estate is a job. My, my job is I'm a real estate agent to I own a real estate business. I, I do the parts of that job that I think I should do. So if you bought a Subway sandwich franchise, you could technically do every single job in that franchise. How many people could you really help? You naturally start to say, well, I want this person to make the sandwiches. I want this person to order the supplies. This person cleans the store. This person does marketing to get people to walk in the door. And you pick the part that you think you'll do the best job in. That was really how I approach real estate sales because as an investor, that's what I did in that world. And I found... You know, if you're getting a call to congratulate you on going into contract, you'd so rather have my assistant, Krista, who's just giddy with excitement for you, call you than my, you know, I've got all the personality of a brand muffin calling to tell you, here's the facts you're now in, in contract. So what I love about this business is that you can, <clears throat> when you do it well, take the people who normally, I call them fish catchers and fish cleaners. And I talk about that in the book too. I can go catch fish. I don't want to clean them. Most people out there, they just want to clean a fish somebody else caught. It's what they're used to. It's what they did in every other job they had. There's less risk. They like it. So if you can be the person to catch all these fish, man, you can make some people's dreams come true, helping them clean it. And if you know that you're a good fish cleaner, don't spend all your time beating yourself up because you're not catching fish. Go find people that got more fish than they know what to do with and, and serve their business uh, through serving the clients. Well, my first partner, he spoke Spanish and I didn't. And we developed a clientele from Mexico City and Guadalajara. Oh, wow. And I filled out all the contracts because yep. he didn't like to do that. And he talked to, to our clients because I couldn't speak Spanish. But we had a great team and a great relationship. And uh, but yeah, finding other people to work with is, is a very valuable piece if you can find some. And probably easier to do in this industry than in many others. Yeah, for sure. You got a few people laughing at uh, on Facebook on the brand muffin personality. By the way. That, was, that was hilarious. I'm answering it on the phone right now. I'm like, that's funny. Oh, that was good, man. Well, David, thanks for being on, man. Anything we missed that you wanted to cover that you wanted to talk about before we, we ended here? You know, I'll probably just highlight the point that if you're listening to this and you're an agent and your business isn't doing what you want, which, and I don't have any data to back this up, but in my experience, I found most solo agents top out right around 40 to 50 deals a year. It's almost impossible to get to where you're doing more than that without, without some help. You're probably subconsciously approaching it with a W-2 mindset that you had before you got into a pure sales role, and that's what's holding you back. If you want to burst out of anywhere between zero to 40 to zero to 50, and you want to be able to take it into the next step, you have to approach it like it's a business, that you are a business owner. And part of owning a business is marketing. Now you can be the marketer. You can go talk to people about your business all the time. That's catching fish. Part of it is servicing the business you've already got. Who's making the sandwich when the customer walks into Subway? Who's showing the houses to the buyer? Who's cleaning that fish that you just caught? And that the people who do really, really well have embraced the understanding that they can't do it all. And they've, they've identified and specified the part that they're going to work on. They've leveraged it to other people. They've trained those people. Maybe they fired those people and replaced them with new people that will do it at the standard that they want to have. And real estate is so much more fun and so much more productive when you're doing the parts you enjoy doing, the reasons that you got into the business in the first place and not trying to do everything. Good, end, Dude, good ending, bro. Saul, anything you want to add in closing, buddy? 
No, I would just say when you walk into a real estate office and you see an agent that doesn't know what to do, you ever find that they have more time in the day than they think they have things to get done? They're not on the right track, right? There should be things for you to be doing all the time. And David, thanks for all the insight. It was great. It was great to participate with you. Thank you guys. It was great to meet you. This was a blast. Yeah, dude. Thanks for being on. And when you, dude, when the book is released, I'd love to have you back on so we can kind of break down the book and go into the chapters that we think are are standing out. You want to do that? Oh, absolutely. Let's do that for sure. Awesome, man. Let's do that. David, thank you. Saul, awesome having you on, my friend. Great seeing you. Everybody else, thank you so much for joining us. Have an awesome week. Podcasts.